Hi, I'm Joshua Sabari, a thoracic medical oncologist from NYU Langone Health. I'm here with Dr. Isabel Prishigal from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and Dr. Nicholas Rose from Mount Sinai and our special guest, Dr. Rahul Gusain from the University of Rochester Medical Center. Welcome to Lung Cancer Conversations. We are here to discuss the practical challenges of conducting lung cancer treatment in the community setting. Dr. Gassane, you've been very successful in clinical practice in the community, as well as in the you know, medical education sp uh, sphere. Um, how did you sort of get over this difficulty in getting patients into the clinic and getting patients to see subspecialists in your practice? When I started, I was, so, I was a solo practitioner right after my fellowship. Every single day, I would literally walk out of my clinic almost crying, thinking that, am I doing the right thing for my patients? And that knot in my stomach forced me to keep up with all the CME, build relationships with not just locally, but reach out to people nationally that were doing all these CME conferences, thought leaders, to make sure I was doing the best for my patients. And to my surprise, all these people around the country were so willing to help. So it felt like they were all email away. So in my experience, one thing I would recommend community oncologists is to reach out. Send that email, pick up the phone, you know, go to conferences, uh, meet people in your space. I think that's critical. And you've done that uh, tremendously well. What, what advice would you give to a, a new oncologist starting out in the community? In my experience, anyone who's starting in solo uh, practice, Social media plays a big role. Learn from ongoing discussions. The other thing that has helped me is exactly to what you've said. We need to be more proactive in the community. Pick up that phone, reach out to someone just across our cancer center or across the nation. If there is a silver lining to COVID, now we can easily collect, uh, connect virtually. In my experience, you know, it's commonly thought that in the academic setting, resources are endless, and I think we all know that's not true. But, you know, thinking about if you were going to develop your community practice and you had endless resources, what would you do to make your community practice as efficient and effective for patients to get the best possible care? Oh, I love that. Um, I really think no matter where we are, the way to deliver best care has to be patient-centered, patient-focused. The other thing I would love to see is nothing to do with just the treatment paradigm, but the EMR speaking with each other. That is something that we lack if you have different siloed practices, each different practices on their own EMR, and that communication can be tough. And then these patients are getting scans after scans at different institutions when it's done at their home base already. So I would love to see that uh, evolve over a period of time. I would love to see more tumor boards or multi-D conferences established in these community settings. I would love to see more clinical trial enrollment for our patients in these settings. You know, unfortunately, when we mandated electronic medical records, we didn't mandate that they talk to each other. And even down the, down the road, sometimes an academic institution that may be a stone's throw away from me, we don't talk in our medical records. And then if we expand that to biomarker testing, if you send an, a, a tissue sample outside, in my experience, we may be getting these via fax. You know, this is 2023 and we're getting fax results of our, of our biomarkers and then they have to get uploaded into a chart. And then a physician has to know to look for those results and act on those results. So unfortunately, it's a really archaic system. And the other thing we often talk about when we're talking about biomarkers is these can be presented in so many different ways. And in my experience, essentially we talk about license plate diagnoses, it's, you know, uh, letters and numbers all smushed together with all these mutations or insertions or deletions. And sometimes they're presented in different ways depending on which company you're working with. So Dr. Gosain, when you're in a community practice and you get these biomarker testing results, who are you rely on to help interpret if you're having trouble understanding what that means? So previously I've reached out to that third party uh, to help us break down some of those uh, gray areas saying, hey, you're picking up on a mutation. Is this valid? Is there something that I can act on? The other thing that I had done in the past, I was reaching out to other tertiary coronary centers saying, this is the report. Can you please help me 
break this down. Hey, make a great point. These reports are complicated. You know, oftentimes I read them and I have questions, so I'm reaching out to colleagues. So, you know, having humility and thinking about how can we make the best decision for our patient. You know, again, that same point, just ordering the test is not sufficient. You have to actually have the results and know what to do with the results. So, you know, taking the, the, the sort of standpoint of your education front uh, and, you know, educating community oncologists, what are things that we can do uh, to educate community oncologists on how to better utilize these reports, how to better read them, understand them, but actually translate uh, that to good patient care? Yeah, I think that is so critical now. In my experience, I do think that third parties are now doing a better job instead of just sending you a 20 or 30 page summary. They give you one or two page summaries saying these are actionable mutations. This is what's FDA approved for certain things. So I think that it's helpful, but educating community oncologists around all those nuances is very important. We're talking about precision medicine and we're talking about educating other practitioners. But we also have to educate the patient as far as what we're doing and why we're doing it. It's very nice to meet you. Unfortunately, I have, as you said, Dr. Gosain, two, three, four weeks for my biomarker testing to come back to have the comprehensive testing to make the right decision. How do you pass that message on to a patient to help them understand? And you, know, you say, this is to make personalized care, precision medicine for you and your tumor and your biology in this right situation. And conveying that message really helps set the stage so you can get those results and, and then act on them. So going back to this concept of resources, um, you know, sometimes resources can be limited, uh, but have you ever used uh, resources outside of your community practice or your institution? Maybe national resources or, you know, resources that may be available through other organizations to help uh, with your patient's care. Yeah, given in rural settings, I think that you often rely on these national resources where you're sending your patients either online or established societies. NCCN does a very good job in guiding our patients on nutrition. So things like that, often uh, we jump on national resources rather than having something in-house. Right now, I have uh, the capability of getting everyone on board. And those are the differences, what we were talking about things that we see in academics versus something that we don't have in community. You had touched upon that in the rural setting, you know, you don't have all the funding that, you know, that may be an academic center, or these patients are not as educated, perhaps, or they don't have the resources that someone, you know, in, in a big metropolis does have. How do you guide them and how do you usher them through this, you know, extremely taxing journey? I think that in the rural settings, we often rely on the minimal resources that we have but this is, again, a good time to get in touch with your tertiary or quaternary partners to say that if this patient is going to be better served there while you continue to provide some supportive care locally, that's a great thing. That's, that's a win-win for the patients. I actually see a pretty socioeconomically disadvantaged population. And, you know, I actually find that, you know, to be really rewarding because these are the patients you can make really big impacts on. And I think those extra services are the things that make the difference. The social worker, the nutritionist, the patient navigator, all of these extra services that can come into engagement that support the patient through their journey. You know, as, as practitioners, we think about the diagnosis, the treatment, and the execution of those therapies. But then we don't think about the fact that the patient is paying, you know, $20 to get parking in the city at an academic center or traveling and paying $40 for a tank of gas to get to the radiation therapy appointment and all of those things that add up. And then, I, I, as you said, Dr. Gosain, I think that's where we really can synergize a lot is that a patient can come to me and they can see a cancer specialized nutritionist and get some really pro tips on how to get through this, this challenging part in their life and then bring that back to the community where they can do it at home. And one of the services I've really found valuable recently is, as you said, bringing a lot of care to home and things like infusion services. If patients are having trouble with PO intake and they need some IV fluids, I have the luxury of being able to call on, on a program that can come to their home and give them IV fluids. Dr. Gosain, do you feel like you have those types of resources in a community setting where you can bring some of this care home to them? Unfortunately, um, in my previous settings, we would rely on some of these resources, but they were all backed up. There was a significant delay on when they can see the patient or by the time they could get to the patient, it perhaps would be too late. I think even though we have limited resources in the community or rural settings, I think it is so important to appreciate all the good care that is being delivered. Because in my experience, at the end of the day, these patients are 
very happy staying close to home. Absolutely, and that's my experience too. I feel like whenever I get referrals from the, from the community, I continue to be humbled by how well they're practicing in thoracic oncology. I love when I get to see a patient and I get to say, listen, your oncologist is doing all of the right things. There's not a single thing that's been missed. I couldn't agree more. I hop on the phone, I call that oncologist, I say, I totally agree. I'm gonna send you my note, but I mean, nothing else needs to be done. And that partnership is what we continue to appreciate in the community or in rural settings. Thank you, Dr. Gassane. This is a very informative discussion and, and really appreciate you coming on.